Hi everyone, Fresh Manor 12. Moses reset button for people in Israel and beyond. Uh, uh, I'm Jeff Goodwin, Christian pastor from the UK, and this is like part two uh, from Fresh Manor yesterday, number 11. Okay. Um, once again, I'm reading and I apologise for that, but again, I'm, uh, I've got lots to say. Uh, and and I really need it to be said right, so please forgive me for that. Uh, but it's really important. What I'm what I'm bringing is, I think, probably new for a lot of people. Uh, so um, you know, please be patient with me. Uh, Father, I pray you will hide my mistakes and let my hearers hear what you have to say. Introduction. As I started writing this message, I was interrupted by a phone call from a young lady asking here in Britain for help with food. As I went to help her, I heard two radio programmes that encouraged me in what I write below. As a Christian, I'm already on record as rep repenting for the church's sins and for the sins of my nation against the Jewish people over so many centuries, not least for the persecution of those Jewish first fruits of the gospel from that first Pentecost out of the church with such violence. One of the radio interruptions mentioned above was an interview with a group of Arab and Israeli Jews in the Israeli town of Jaffa. They were aged between 18 and 35 and one of the Arabs was, had put himself forward for election to some local government position. Not happened before in that area or in the, all Israel I think they said. They were looking for looking to the future, you see, and their cry was for love to be released across the nation. As I mentioned in uh, Fresh Manor 11, not a two-state solution, in my opinion, but a unified Israel with Jew and Arab living together in peace. Another of the radio speakers, uh, someone uh, quoted someone as saying, my paraphrase, we need to go right back to the beginning to unravel, unravel this mess. Once again, what I was saying in uh, Fresh Man at 11, when Abram and Isaac had their separate encounters with Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, the occupiers, uh, occupiers of the Gaza Strip, each swearing to live together in the land in peace with the others, all which were, we believe God wanted us to respect today. The political analyst see no option other than a ground offensive. After the first atrocities, Benjamin Netanyahu threatened to change the face of the Middle East. But with his bombs and bullets, all he has given us is more of the same. My proposition, as well as being that of the young people and the mothers of his land, is to say give us more love say this with i say this with love i have a great heart for the jews and palestinians and, and every nation all god's children all precious every single one precious to god on this planet an israeli young woman with six bullets in her legs was asked what she thought of hamas to which she replied she hated them she was asked what she thought of Palestinians, at which her disposition softened, and she said, we love each other, adding that Gaza, where they lived, should be like paradise. I believe Moses in his writings provides us with a reset button, a different option to fill it military might. It is the year of jubilee concept. Every 50 years to have a new beginning, a decree and law that I do not believe has ever been enacted. Certainly not recorded in the scriptures as I've read them. My opening statement, to fight Hamas in their tunnels will be like suicide. The proposed ground offensive 
that will cost over £50 billion pounds and the lives of, say, 50,000 Palestinians and, say, 50,000 of Israel's cherished sons and will not achieve the object of securing a peaceful future but will only raise up a more dedicated terror militia on the backs of those martyred to the Hamas ideology. We, my belief is that Hamas has shot its bolt, at least for the present time, being so can be, igno therefore, can be ignored, stroke contained. I do not consider them to be Palestinians. They are too anti-God and should be left for him to deal with personally. Pharaoh being our example. Love, love is the answer for Israel with an aerial bombardment of food, medicines, etc not caring that a mass will take some of it. Pull the tanks back and send in a massive sea aerial bombardment, parachuting manna, stroke bread. Let it, come, let it come down from the skies and be seen by all. Medicines and turning on the water and trucking in the fuel to demonstrate the sincerity of this new love. With General Joshua, I call upon Israel today to choose whom you will serve, the God of love, or the gods your forefathers worshipped in Egypt, or beyond the river. Let's choose the Lord and have his help. So the year of Jubilee, um, it is so called every 50 years. It is a year what it is a year long festival calling for a new start for everyone. It was called for on the day of atonement in the seventh month, that is when the Feast of Tabernacles is, when on its last day this year Hamas made their devastating bar uh, barbaric attacks. Just picking up from Moses' writings and reading from Leviticus chapter twenty five. Verse 10, consecrate, so this is Moses speaking. Everybody respects Moses, I hope. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land. Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own land. Initially speaking it's about Jews here, okay, I understand that. 11, verse 11, the fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the intended vines. That's kind of like a manna principle and a manna principle is to trust God on a daily basis for your needs. Okay? It's a test. Will you trust God on a daily basis for your needs? Doing stuff his way. And then verse 12, for it is a jubilee and it is to be holy to you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. Verse 13. In this year of Jubilee, everyone is to return to his own property. I appreciate that that needs a little tweaking in these days. Okay, I'm not stupid. <laughs> and then verse 18. Follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws. And you will... Guess what it says? Follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws and you will live safely in the land. Israel's cry, isn't it? That they can just have a secure place to live. As I say above, I do not believe the children of Israel have ever put into practice this law. Let's think about the Palestinians for a moment. Today's Palestinians are not so much direct descendants of the biblical Philistines as we might think of them as. Also interesting is that 
though the Philistines were in the land at the time when God promised the land to Abraham, they were not included in the list of those people who should be judged later when the children of Israel, under God's instructing, first went in and took possession of the land he had promised. Possibly in my thought, that means that God had a, it's a prophetic aspect to their lives. God knew that we were going to come to this day when this would happen and therefore you would let it be understood about from his point of view. So my proposition is for us to take advantage of the year of Jubilee's basic principles for a new beginning. To remember the covenants Abraham and Isaac entered into with Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, to live together peaceably in the land. And encouraged by Moses in Leviticus, Leviticus 19.33, as they are living in the land, uh, they say, do not ill-treat him. The alien, about the alien, as they are living in the land, do not ill-treat him. The, and then it says this, which brings relative, relative to the Palestinian situation. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your firstborn. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. The game changer for Israel and the Palestinians that will secure the desired future for their children of dwelling in the land in safety and in love is to draw a red line across the past. Say that again. To draw a red line across the past. Okay. Just deal with the things as they are living in front of you at the moment. Letting God deal with the offences of the past. You should express regret to each other for your past bad behaviour. You should give and receive forgiveness from each other and in love for each other. We are all God's children, are we not? You should take possession of the land and the future as if, as if you had never sinned against each other. New slate, you see. As if you had never sinned against each other. Take a deep breath. As if Abraham really was your common father, our common father. Israel, you are God's chosen people, his firstborn. I, we, he, looks to you to lead us in these things. His chosen people. You'll be the first for everything, you see. <laughs> Who knows if you can do it? Maybe the rest of us will follow. So I encourage you to have a go. Dare, dare to have a go. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, and by my word, says the Lord. In my previous Fresh Manor 7a message, I demonstrated clearly from the Old and New Testaments that the prophet Jesus, known as the Lamb of God, Emmanuel, the Son of God, and the Son of David, was born to humanity on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. That being so, he would be circumcised on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the day Hamas struck. Their intention was to cut Israel off from the face of the earth. But God's intention, through the covenant he cut with Abraham, of, of this circumcision is the sign, is an everlasting covenant to bless. Genesis 17. That Hamas struck on that day caused me to remember again that my fathers were guilty of similar crimes in those crusades and again I cry out for forgiveness for that. By allowing these things to happen again, I believe that God is saying to us that we must do things his way and not man's way. And unless we do these things, and unless we do, these things will continue to happen, not just to Jew and Arab, but in every nation to greater and lesser degrees. God's promise to Abraham is that he would be a blessing to all the nations on earth. 
I will just remind us of some of the ways that the Arabs and Jews have related to each other in the past. In regard to Egypt, at the time when God gave Abraham's grandson, Joseph, the interpretations of dreams Pharaoh had had of a severe imminent famine, millions of lives were saved from e for Egypt and all the surrounding nations. Great blessing for Egypt there from Joseph. Of, of Babylon, present-day Iraq, Daniel interpreted a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar that caused him to say, The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all his wise men. Moving on, of King Nebuchadnezzar, who got to see a living vision of God walking as a son of the gods in the fiery furnace he had made for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Not many of us get to see God in the flesh kind of thing, do we? The next king, Belshazzar, uh, and for interpreting a dream for him, he gave the command for Daniel to be clothed with purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed third highest ruler in the kingdom. See these Jews in these foreign lands now in exile being, being valued greatly and their God being touched base with. The next king, Darius, was so impressed with Daniel escaping the lion's den that he wrote to all the peoples, nations and men of every language throughout the world, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. If all the Jews lived under that decree, <laughs> they'd not be fighting him, would they? <laughs> the Jews' opponents. They wouldn't be fighting him, would they? They'd be getting on his side. And then further, the Babylonian kings, when the Babylonian uh, kings ended and the kingdom of Persia came into play, which is, of course, the present-day Iran, so um, nobody's looking to Iran much for any help, are they? Well, I'm going to say there's something different going on here. They, they, you know, if there's you know if there's any life in in these words, uh, maybe the king of it, may, the king of it, the rulers of Iran might engage with them a little, if there's any sincerity in their hearts. So King Cyrus is the first of these kings that engages with the Jewish people, and this text is from the Bible in the book of Ezra, chapter one. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia modern-day Iran, the Lord moved his heart to make a proclamation throughout his realm and put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him and let him go to Jerusalem in Judah to build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. It's a good start, isn't it? The people provided for all that was needed and got ready to go to build the temple. Then at verse uh, 2 in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 7, Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver brought when the exiles came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. And in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, The returning Israelites, having settled in their hometowns, came in the seventh month, set up their altar for the morning and evening sacrifices and celebrated, guess which feast? The Feast of Tabernacles. The same time of year as Hamas carried out 
their atrocious attack. Laying the fact, so it's a, it's a direct assault, you see, on, on, on God, isn't it? It's an absolute direct assault on God that Hamas have done. So they're in real trouble with God at this moment in time. Um, laying the foundations, they started to build, and they paid for cedar logs from Lebanon, as, as authorised by King Cyrus, again. One land that I would, can't believe anybody would ever want to live in is Lebanon. Who's ruling that mess? You know, so once again, we need Lebanon to be blessed in these times, don't we? And this time, the people who had been living in the land during the Israelites' exile objected, and the work stopped until the second year of the reign of King Darius, a, a, a Persian, who issued a decree in chapter 6, verse 3. This is what he said. Let the temple re be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices, etc. Verse 4. The costs are to be paid for by the royal treasury. Verse 7. To the local people, he said, Stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Darius further decreed, The expenses of these men are to be fully met out of the royal treasury. <laughs> the Arabs built the temple. <laughs> they, paid, they paid for the temple to be built. Awesome. Verse 9. Whatever is needed by the priests in Jerusalem must be given to them on a daily basis. King Darius' final statement is very strong. Verse 12. May God, who has caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who lift a hand to change this decree or to destroy this temple in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have decreed it. Let it be carried out with diligence. And so the temple was built and consecrated. And then there's this verse I didn't notice until I was reading it yesterday, I think. But we mustn't miss what is said in verse 22. On the celebrating of the first Passover, you know, it was setting up everything. For seven days they celebrated with joy the feast of unleavened bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy, listen, by changing the attitude of the God of Assyria, so that he assisted in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. The king of Assyria, the king from the north, is also putting his hand to this. These people have not read these scriptures. They've not, they don't know their own history. They need to be told their own history. Because these crees are... They, oh, I'd better read my notes. And I'll be preaching in a minute. <laughs> Turn, turn over in, your, in the Bible a, a few pages to the book of Nehemiah and see with what favour King Artaxerxes of Persia sends Nehemiah to rebuild his home city of Jerusalem. To, turn over a few pages more to the book of Esther at the time of King Xerxes of Persia again who reigned from the city of Susa. After his Queen displeased him, he sent her into exile, and after Esther had won a beauty contest of all the young ladies in the land, King Xerxes married her. He did not know she was a Jew. Mordecai, her uncle, saved the king's life when he exposed a plot to kill him. Haman, the king's highest adviser, hated Mordecai and duped the king into issuing a decree to kill all the Jews scattered throughout the 127 provinces of the Persian kingdom. Through Esther, the ruse was revealed to the king, who promoted Mordecai to be second in rank only to himself, and he administered greatly for the good of the king's people of the Persian kingdom, as well as for that of the Jews. So if I want to... Uh, I want to notice two things from this story. First, 
that the Jews were dispersed into the 127 provinces of this kingdom that extended from Upper Egypt to India. Massive territory. And that most of them, as I understand it, most of them never went back to live in the land of Israel. How many kept the Jewish identity and how many assimilated? I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, but just to record, only 42,360 went back with Ezra in that first returning. And I don't think there was another returning. <laughs> the simple point I'm making is that if those Jews did assimilate, many people will have Jewish blood in them and not know it. Maybe we all are a bit Jewish. Who knows it? The second point is that all the decrees that the Persian kings made to bless the Jews that I've been reading about have not been rescinded because of the principle of the law of the Medes and the Persians, which said that not even the decree maker himself uh, could cancel them. So once the decree was made, it's set in stone. To see in the story above, Xerxes, so, so we see in the story above that Xerxes did not withdraw the decree to kill the Jews that he had made. He only made another decree <laughs> that they could defend themselves. <laughs> so they did defend themselves and then they prospered and he prospered and all of Persia prospered because the Jews were present in 127 places. And then we can see that same principle uh, in the relationship between King Darius and Daniel in the story of the lion's den. Daniel had to go in the den, didn't he? The king couldn't rescind the, the order. So do the rulers in Iran know about, know, know about this history and these decrees that we would say and their law would say are still in place? The answer for peace in the Middle East and beyond is that the brothers and sisters should love one another as we should in every nation and every province around the world shouldn't we the war waged by love strangely a radically different mindset to what is normal empire building king principles isn't it empires are all built on war um, so the war we want to wage is a war of love. Strangely, a radically different mindset. A mindset that we call all leaders of nations to, to, to enter into. The strategy of love for Israel and, and the Palestinians at this time. Um, one, so I've made a number of points that I would suggest. A different option, you see, an option for peace, an option for love, not an option for war, not an option for ground forces. So Israel taking the lead, you see, Israel, God's chosen people to his first choice for, for, for what he wants to do on the earth comes through them. Um, so Israel must accept the challenge to do it, to do it God's way and take the first steps. Israel must choose to love all the Palestinians in their pro in their promised land and this must be done in sincerity the demonstration to demonstrate the sincerity Israel must stop the bombing and pull its tanks back from the border removing the threat of a ground offensive only keeping an eye on Hamas who we, who we are going to ignore uh, as we have handed them over to God number four the group of 18 to 35 year olds, both Jews and Arabs I mentioned at Jaffa, should be brought into the planning room. Also bring representatives of Arab and Jewish mothers and young and old Palestinians from the West Bank. Let their voices be given genuine consideration, including Jewish migrants coming home. Towards living together and building the land, not so much to, re to rehearse in the affairs of the past, okay? That won't be helpful. Just make that one statement to start off with. We're going to love each other from now on. 
Let them come and em let them come with empty hands. The challenge for those around the table is to love one another. The challenge is to find a way to live together. Because of the covenants of Genesis 12 that God made with Abraham, we must give the Israels, Israelis the chair of these discussions. God is looking on us. God, God is looking on so the chairperson does not always have to have their own way. Indeed, they will do well to promote others' ideas over their own, all being sincere. In my personal experience, it is when I have laid something down in love that the Lord has restored it to me with interest. The Iron Dome protecting them, if they are willing, half of the Israeli families who have left the villages near the Gaza border should return and Palestinian families from the West Bank or those in exile should be invited to occupy the other houses. You understand that I do not know the people who will be the most suitable for these houses of integration. Forming friendship councils to promote good relationships as the towns grow and develop. Number six, once again, I have little knowledge of how to address the occupation of the West Bank. The Jewish settlers have been seen as a problem in the past, but they must include Palestinians or other Arabs who are still hurting from when they left and never came back. Make room for them. Make room for them. That's what Abimelech did for Abraham, isn't it? Make room for them. Each making the other pri their priority. One house for the Israelis, then one house for the Palestinians. Nationalities may fall away under this new banner of love, as Abimelech did with Abraham. For Gaza, starting from the south, ask the Palestinian reconstruction ask that a Palestinian reconstruction company be formed. Young men and women can be trained on the job as tradespeople and begin providing building materials. Let the least damaged properties be referred first repaired first, including schools and hospitals, and moving on to complete clearance of debris and new buildings being erected. Make community buildings and activities a priority for peoples to get to know each other again. Release the love. And then number eight I've got here. Hopefully for the time, hopefully by the time points one to seven are well underway, a mass will have worked out that they are no longer wanted and that Israel is in their turn will be wanting to move south to live alongside their Arab friends. Some miracle from God making that bit possible. Leopards can change their spots in the kingdom of heaven. Both Moses and David had committed murder and yet served God so faithfully and so well. So today's Arabs, including Muslims, who own Abram as their father, should recognise the decrees laid down by their former kings and seek and practise love towards the Jewish brothers, as I believe most ordinary Jews and Arabs and Muslims want to do. Just set them free and let them get on with it. Just live together in peace. The emphasis, I say again, towards Arabs, including Muslims who own Arab as their father, Abraham as their father, should recognise the decrees laid down by their former kings and seek and practise love towards their Jewish brothers, as I believe most ordinary Jews, Arabs and Muslims want to do, just to live together in peace. Just, um, just last night two hostages were released. One of the ladies, as they were, as they were leaving their their escort coming out turned to shake hands of, with the Palestinian with the Hamas soldier I presume who, who was carrying a gun and um, and they shook hands as, as, she, as she left so that's a, a mighty thing to do isn't it a mighty example for us so the conclusion of the matter when Jews sin and get into trouble often in the past God has sent a deliverance of great benefit to them, i.e. most recently 
the Holocaust resulted in them getting a new homeland. Who would have dreamt that? Who would have dreamt that at that time? That is what I believe is going on now. The sin God wants to open their eyes to is that for 2,000 years they have missed seeing that my Jesus, their Yeshua, is their Messiah. I know I am not the right person to be bringing this message. As my forefathers, as I have said, have behaved as badly as today's Hamas have. I'm going back further to the birth of the church when the Gentiles violently hounded out those many thousands and thousands of founding Jews. Please forgive me and us for our sin and include us behind that red line I ask you to draw across all of our pasts. We must look to a new future in love and friendship together. Finally, I am compelled to speak of Jesus, my Saviour, and the Jewish Messiah, who is God's perfect Lamb, David's son, and God's son, and therefore God as a human being. That is why God made us in his image, so that when he wanted to become one of us, our body would be worthy of him to possess it, to dwell in it, to possess, or to possess it for himself, to dwell in it by his spirit. In the coming of the Messiah, a message in us is required. The change from law to love. In the coming of the Messiah, a change in us is required from law to love. Okay? Jesus' summary of what the law is, is love God with all your heart and love your neighbour as yourself. Nothing more complicated than that. I speak about this change of law because <laughs> that means that the law of the Medes and Persians has to be changed, doesn't it? <laughs> or else we'll all have to, have to go to Jerusalem and build another temple. Mm. <laughs> um, so I'm reading this next bit, okay? We have not kept the laws of Moses, nor honoured the decrees of the Persian kings. But it turns out that Xerxes was a prophet. Ezra chapter 6 verse 11 Anticipating that someone might want to disobey him and possibly want to build another temple in Jerusalem, he said, Furthermore, if anyone changes this edict, a beam A beam is to be pulled from his house and he is to be lifted up and impaled upon it. Clearly he is speaking of when Jesus would be crucified in the future. And of him saying, of, and of Jesus saying of that temple, not one stone would be left on another and that a new king, a new kind of temple would be built. And that temple was destroyed in AD 70, wasn't it? Nearly finished. David had said to God, another big concept coming. David had said to God he wanted to build a house for God. But God would not let him, saying Solomon could do that. But to David, he said, I will build a house for you. A different kind of house. A temple built of people as living stones in which God would dwell by his spirit. The first stone is Jesus, the eternal son of God himself, as the cornerstone. And then people from every language, tribe, 
and nation joining in. Christ in you and me, the hope of glory. I will give you the last words, I will give the last words of Jesus from John chapter 4 to finish with. For no reason ever explained, Jesus had to, had to go to Samaria, to Sica, somewhere slap bang in the middle of the West Bank, the occupied territories of today. Jesus met a Samaritan woman there and revealed that he knew she had five husbands and the one she had now was not her own. And I quote from verse 18 onwards. She said, What you say is quite true, sir, the woman said. I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks God in spirit, God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. To the peoples of the Middle East, I say, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. into the peace and the freedom that you so ache for. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.